Hello everyone, welcome uh, to lecture 5. Uh, we'll, in this lecture, we'll continue talking about the, um, the contents of chapter 7. So we've been talking about elastic waves in particulate material. And continuing from lecture 4, um, today we'll talk about section 7.4 to 7.7. Okay, let's start. So now uh, we'll talk about the unsaturated particulate media. So basically, the, when you have an unsaturated soil, because the water content is low, you get um, the unsaturated condition causes capillary force to, and the, this capillary force increases the skeletal contact forces. So also, it increases the effective stress. So then the relative movement of the meniscus or menisci surrounding grain contacts causes viscous attenuation. So before there was no water, when you imagine it's just dry skeleton, dry soil. And then the attenuation only occurs at the friction, you know, the uh, grain contacts by the frictional movement. But now because we have water, forming the meniscus so then as the particle moves maybe like if it's the shear then the, there's some water also moving together so the uh, when you think about the P wave then the um, the water meniscus will have to move together with to the uh, direction of the direction of propagation so the relative movement of the meniscus causes the viscous attenuation because the uh, water will have different density and the viscosity with the uh, from the grain itself so the attenuation coefficient 1 over q so over the inverse q this is as before i said it's a double of damping ratio and it's function of the viscosity of the fluid nu and omega the frequency and the sigma is the confining stress. So as uh, the water is added, it will increase the um, attenuation. And due to the capillary force, the P wave attenuation also increases because of the uh, addition of the water. But the S wave attenuation goes down because it increases the contact force. So that it minimized it, so you get the more confining stress, so damping gets smaller. When the moisture content is less than about 5 to 7 percent, main sky failure and regeneration can justify the significant energy dissipation. So that happens when the main sky is very small. So you can think of this picture. So main sky is very small, so by moving small amount, this meniscus will have to deform and it may fail if the strain is bigger, uh, quite big. So then it will um, cause the additional energy dissipation. So um, compression of the gas bubble, when you think about the gas phase or the air phase, uh, compression of gas produces the adiabatic heating of the gas and gas bubble motions may also dissipate energy. Saturated porous media, the P wave is much smaller than the shear wave damping. And uh, unsaturated porous media, um, shear wave damping is smaller than the P wave damping. So in the unsaturated media, because the uh, water movement, relative water movement to the uh, grain movement, causes the P wave attenuation. In saturated porous media, um, it's fully saturated with water, so there is no air, so then the, uh, you get uh, less dissipation. dissipation. So, um, so let's talk about the saturated media first. And uh, we'll talk about the low frequency parameters based on the Gassman's equation. So here, uh, 
Gassman model or Gassman equation. It's the famous equation uh, that people use to predict the P wave or the uh, P wave velocity at low frequency. So here uh, we need to define the density of the fluid uh, each phase, density and bulk modulus and grain uh, shear modulus, and for the grains too, and skeleton, and for the mixture and porosity. So let's look at the fluid first. So um, in fluid, uh, we need unsaturated or partially saturated, then you have air phase and the water phase in the pore, in the void. So then they'll tell you if there's a fluid pressure change because of the wave propagation, um, it will cause the volume change in these two phases. So when we have like particles like this, so then we have water, And when there's pressure change by delta U, pressure will act in every direction. So then pressure change at water phase and air phase will be the same. So this means that the water and air does not split, does not split the uh, uh, applied force. So from that sense, um, which one will be better? which model will better fit on unsaturated condition when this is delta u. So because the uh, uh, pressure change will be, uh, the water will feel the pressure change by delta u, and also air will feel the same amount of the pressure change, so this will be better fit, the series model. So then, if we remember the series model that was k equilibrium was k1 plus k2, right? So based on this assumption or the, this model, we can derive the fluid bulk modulus. But because it's fluid, it doesn't have the shear modulus. Huh? So let's look at the, uh, this definition. The fluid bulk modulus is delta u over epsilon v. And here, epsilon v will be volume change of the fluid over total volume of the fluid. Right? So, so then um, this delta vf, so fluid volume change, will be sum of water volume change and air volume change. So then you get this equation, right? Um, and then uh, we can replace this one for each phase, air phase and the water phase, with bulk modulus of this water and air. How do we do that? Um, because we know that the delta U is B times epsilon V. So if it's air, air, the bulk modulus of air, times like this, right? So then using this, um, if I write it here, delta VA, the air volume change, will be air volume times delta U over VA. The bulk modulus of the air. It's gonna be the same for the um, the, the water too. So if I can write it here, um, fluid bulk modulus will be delta u over this one, and v w for the water delta u. Air. like this. 
And if you um, simplify this equation, the final equation will look like 1 over s bw plus 1 minus s ba. So here the volume fraction of water and volume fraction of air and volume fraction of fluid are replaced with degree of water saturation, S. So using this equation, we can uh, exercise uh, to determine an estimated bulk model of the mixture fluid when there's air and water are mixed together. Um, and we can think that we can calculate the uh, fluid bulk models when the degree of saturation is 99.9%. .9%. So we can uh, do this one in, in the class. And uh, so if you plot it over a wide range of air saturation here, the volume fraction of the air, as the air volume fraction increases, from almost zero. So almost when the air volume fraction is almost zero, zero then the uh, mixture bulk modulus is identical to the uh, water bulk modulus. It's the same. Eh? So it's just a 2 gigapascal, 2.2 gigapascal. And as the volume fraction increases, air volume fraction increases, which means that you get more air and air inside that the flu inside the void, the void, then it decreases significantly. So when you have 1% of air volume in that fluid, pore fluid, then bulk modulus almost goes to zero or uh, you know, <clears throat> close to the air bulk modulus because the difference between the water bulk modulus and air bulk modulus is you know, several orders of magnitude here. So this is what 10 to 5 Pascal. And this is 10 to 9 Pascal, so it's about four orders of magnitude difference. Um, what about the mass density? Uh, we can use just a weighted average concept here. So fluid density will be the F. So that's going to be S rho W plus or minus S rho A. But we know that the air density is almost nothing negligible. So this becomes degree of saturation times water density. And uh, when we have the particles now, but these particles are not touching each other. So we can think that you have like clay suspension, maybe like 5% weight percent uh, weight of clay and rest of them is water. So then it's a clay suspension. Or you can think of like sand floating in water. But the sand particles are not touching each other, so there's no skeleton contact. So in this case, bulk modulus of this suspension will be, uh, how can we get this? Um, which model will suit better? So grain, fluid, and grain fluid is this a parallel model, series model. Right? So when there's, um, here, when there's, stress or stress uh, apply stress or the pressure grain and fluid will the same amount of force huh? so we'll use this one so then b suspension will be one over n over b f plus or minus n p grain so here the volume fraction between grain and fluid is the porosity, right? So same concept with the um, degree of saturation. 
And mass density also is going to be uh, just weighted average. So 1 minus n rho g plus n rho f. Right? Okay. So then what happens finally when particles come into contact with each other and granular skeleton carries part of the applied isotropic stress. So now the particles are packed to touch each other. So then when there's stress, delta sigma and delta sigma isotropically, then this delta sigma will be carried by the particles and also carried by fluid huh? by increasing the fluid pressure. So here the load is shared or between the skeleton which is the effective stress delta sigma prime and the fluid delta u so basically this is the concept for the effective stress so if you remember the one that you learned from the uh, soil mechanics total stress is summation of effective stress increase and pore to pressure increase or the pore to pressure change eh? right so same concept the bulk models of the mixture then what will happen because these are shared then now we are going to use series model on the parallel model like this one so this is going to be This, is, this will be the suspension phase, right? the B suspension, and this will be B skeleton, BSK. Okay. So, the mixed soil or the packed soil and fluid field particulate, particulate media, uh, bulk models of this uh, fluid field particulate media is BSK plus B suspension. So then this becomes um, BSK plus. I think we derive the bulk models for the suspension. So N over BF plus or minus N over BG. So this is the gas simplified gas mass equation when the uh, low confi confinement is very small or the granular or the skeletal bulk modulus is less than the grain bulk modulus general equation for the gasman model is this one you can see there's some additional term psk over bg right the skeletal bulk models over grain bulk models and here too so then if the grain bulk models is much much bigger than the skeletal bulk models then we can assume that this goes to zero and this goes to zero and the order equation become simplified to be identical to this equation. And what about the shear modulus? The shear modulus uh, is now affected by the fluid, right? So then the mixture or the, uh, the soil, skeletal shear stiffness is the same with the, uh, no, just shear stiffness of the skeletal, whether it's fully saturated or unsaturated. Huh? But here we don't consider the, um, the capillary effect. Um, the constraint modulus uh, based on the elasticity 
the constraint modulus m is b plus 3 over 4 times g, the shear modulus. So then this will become this. So the m s k will be the shear mod uh, the constraint modulus of the skeleton plus uh, bulk modulus of the suspension. Um, as the uh, because the b water is 2.2 gigapascal, which is very very big. Uh, when the degree of saturation is almost zero, um, m of the um, partially saturated or unsaturated soil will be the same with the skeletal constraint modulus, but as the pore saturation or the water saturation goes up and close to the 100%, and this portion becomes big, so that you know, suspension bulk modulus is larger than the constraint modulus of the skeleton. Um, even though the G-mix and G-SK are the same, the velocity of the shear modulus is different when you have dry soil and saturated soil. So shear modulus is lower in saturated soil than in dry soil, even though the uh, skeletal shear stiffness is the same because the mass density increases. Um, so shear modulus is G over rho and even though this is the same, the uh, rho, the density, will different depending on the saturation. Finally, the equation for uh, bulk models of the mixed soil and the shear models of the mixed soil do not apply when particulate materials are unsaturated because the capillary forces increases the stiffness of the granular skeleton. So here, um, we are just assuming there is no capillary effect. Huh? Then, what about the um, uh, attenuation? At low frequency, local fluid flow or squirting occurs. So because there is some time for water or the fluid, pore fluid can flow during the uh, propagation of the wave. Um, there's some local fluid in, in the pores. Huh? So if the water is here, and then it can go you know, squirt to the neighboring pores when the wave is comes. So because the wave propagation is kind of a pressure transfer, right? So it's like a sound. When you have a sound, air pressure changes to deliver this vibration. Huh? It's the same in the uh, saturated pulse media. So there, this is the predominant energy dissipation mechanism in saturated soil in small strain, and which is the uh, squirting attenuation model, or squirt model, we call it squirt model. So um, I strongly suggest to read this paper, Marv Coander in Tussauds. Uh, 1978 and here the how fast or what will be the time taken to squeeze out from one pore during the propagation that's the uh, characteristic frequency fs and characteristic frequency is bg over viscosity of the fluid so um the Losses that occur during the PNS wave propagation vary with the degree of saturation. Uh, in saturated condition, as we've seen, the uh, P wave damping is less than the shear wave damping. In unsaturated condition, and P wave damping becomes bigger because of the air, and the shear wave damping is smaller. Okay. And then the last discussion will be why is low frequency propagation on drain condition? Um, time, let's think about the time for load application versus time for pressure diffusion. So uh, how long uh, water will have to escape from one pore to the other pore uh, when there's pressure coming in. So when there's pressure, uh, pressure rise to water will like to escape. Uh? Um, so then drained loading, undrained loading condition, the T load, is different color, it's much, much smaller than the time for diffusion. 
in drained loading condition it's gonna be opposite right and here the time for diffusion is defined or can be estimated using this equation and here L is representative size of the effective region or it could be a layer thickness or foundation size um, so for example if foundation is L and when there's load stress um, here the water will the water pressure will go up but this will escape right so then diffusion time will be affected by the uh, escaping path which is the length of the water to escape and also the uh, pressure diffusion coefficient of this material of this soil which is the same with the consolidation coefficient cv so in that sense um, if we look at the wave propagation from this kind of a uh, undrained loading or you know time for loading and the diffusion time concept time scale of the wave is the uh, period t so 1 over f and uh, if it's the length scale then the length scale will be the wavelength which is the lambda right so then how long does it take for uh, water to escape which is the time for diffusion here is what l over cv right and the l will be lambda and lambda is vf right so vf square over cvf square so l here v over f And here, I think uh, uh, in the textbook, um, they use the uh, 2L, but uh, more or less it's the same. Eh? So then when we compare this diffusion time and the uh, time for loading, the loading time scale, as the frequency increases, the time for loading increases linearly. However, the time for diffusion increases faster at the faster rate because it's a square so the, the as the frequency goes down t diffusion is becomes really bigger than the load so then this is the undrained condition at time uh, at high frequency condition uh, it's the same it's gonna be the undrained condition so but when the frequency increases like to infinite so much then the, there will be some time uh, there will be some point that the, uh, it is not anymore the undrained condition so uh, in section 7.6 we're gonna see the spectral response in saturated media um, focusing on the high frequency characteristic so far we've seen the Gassman's model that's applicable for low frequency regime as frequency increases, differential inertial effects causes the relative displacement of fluid with respect to the solid. It means that the, uh, because the fluid viscosity is different from solid, so then the movement of the fluid becomes uh, out of phase with the particle movement. So then there is some relative displacement between the fluid and the solid the grain and this causes the uh, spectral response so the, which means that the, uh, the response wave velocity and the attenuation varies with frequency because you know how fast it's vibrating like slowly the inertial effects will be different so um, beyond derived theoretical formulas for predicting frequency dependent modulus of saturated rocks here there are assumptions. Assumption is the media is isotropic and homogeneous. All pores are uniform size, interconnected wavelengths. We are looking at the only the long wavelength uh, propagation. So it assumes the uh, <coughs> equivalent continent, no brilliant effect. And relative motion between phase satisfied the Darcy is low. And there are no chemical or electrical interaction between phases and thermal effects are neglected. 
The final equation forms are shown in this table. Um, we need to get the determinant of this uh, determinant, determinant of this matrix, then the, you get the PV velocity and also the shear velocity. Um, here are some parameters and H, M is like H and C is here, right? Um, M is inside and D, right? M is here. So then if you solve this one, you get this kind of a response. Here, um, I think the real value will be the velocity and the imaginary value will be the, the attenuation will be correlated to the attenuation. And you can see um, P wave is very low, uh, it has the lower limit at the low frequency. So V P naught is here. And as it frequency increases, it uh, increases at some region here. And then it converges to a certain value. That's V P at high frequency limit. And here the shear velocity is the same, right? S wave at low frequency limit and Vs at high frequency limit. And what happens in here in the transition? That's where you have the biggest attenuation. Right? And this type of behavior is called relaxation behavior. If it's so, there's relaxation behavior and there's a resonance behavior. If there's a resonance behavior, the um, well, P wave velocity will go up at resonance and it's gonna go down like this, right? But uh, it's not, so it has smooth increase like this. And at that transition, you have bell shape of curve for the attenuation response, spectral response. So velocity increases with frequency and the maximum changes occur near the relaxation frequency. So here it's called the relaxation frequency, FR. A low frequency Gassman limit of the BIO theory and Gassman solution is adequate for frequency smaller than 10% of the uh, characteristic frequency or relaxation frequency. So if this is the frequency of the relaxation, then if it's one order of magnitude less than that value, then the almost the Gassman's equation applies. Huh? And one thing that you can notice is that there's a P wave, another P wave mode, it's called the slow P wave or second P wave. Um, this one is the fast P wave standard. And the slow P wave attenuates really quickly here and uh, it increases to a, a certain value as, as the frequency increases. Um, it is very difficult to observe, but it increases with frequency. Uh, when you look at the number, P wave velocity is about, is it fast, it's about 1500, right? Or to uh, 1700 meter per second. And shear wave is about 200 meter per second. And P wave, uh, slow P wave starts from, I guess, 10 or less than there, right? 10 meter per second to like 200 meter per second. So when you try to measure it, it's kind of uh, masked by this shear wave of the tail, like the tail of this shear wave, so that it's very difficult to observe. And also it dies really quickly because of the high attenuation. Here the attenuation value, you know, this is the two times of the damping, and it's about 0 0.5, 0 0.05, 0 0.05, but the here you can see that um, the value is like 100 times bigger than the other uh, damping value. Um, the, when you simplify this full equation of the BIOT model, then you can get the uh, lower frequency limit and the high frequency limit um, in terms of like high to low frequency ratio. So this is the same with the Gassman's equation. And this is the shear wave velocity for the low, um, low frequency limit. And this is high frequency limit over low frequency limit velocity ratio. 
So Vp infinite over Vp naught, Vs infinite over Vs naught. And characteristic frequency is defined here. Um, and as I said, the lower limit is applicable when the frequency is less than the 10% of the characteristic frequency. And attenuation is um, can be expressed as a function of the velocity ratio minus 1. Um, so then characteristic frequency, as I said, um, here we saw this one in, in this table. And low frequency velocity, high frequency velocity, and the attenuation increases, the velocity ratio increases. Huh? So this means that um, if you look at this graph again, if the velocity difference is bigger or like this, then the attenuation also increases more and more. That means that, that there's much more uh, dispersion uh, that causes the difference in low frequency and the high frequency. So that's, that means that the, you get a uh, high attenuation or energy dissipation at the relaxation frequency. Um, <clears throat> what is this, this one in the... Okay, let's do this one together. So let's get the characteristic frequency using this equation. Um, when we have a clay soil and when we have sandy soil, it will uh, the characteristic frequency will be totally different, and also the wavelength huh? at that characteristic frequency. So characteristic frequency here will be uh, for the clay soil. F C will be n g two pi k. Here k is the hydraulic conductivity, so 0 0.4 times 9.8 meter per square second and 2 pi and 10 to the negative 9 meter per second right so then um, you know we get the just approximate solution so then um, this will be a several number uh, number and this will be also like six or something so then this can go and cancel so it's gonna be 10 to the 9 Hertz. So frequency 10 to the 9 Hertz. And then the velocity is 200 meter per second. So then we can get the uh, lambda. And here lambda will be 0.2 micrometer from uh, Vs over Fc. And for the sandy soil, um, we can do the same computation and characteristic frequency will be about here is about 1 gigahertz, but it's about 10 kilohertz and lambda is about 20 millimeter. So it's a huge difference because of the permeability difference. Huh? As the permeability decreases, the characteristic frequency increases, right? the bio dispersion effects lose relevance. Fc is too high. So in general, in, uh, in clay, even in clay, the P wave for the ultrasonic frequency range is about several megahertz. So then characteristic frequency is much higher than this uh, wave propagation mode so that the uh, Gassman's equation can be applied to you know, easily to the clay soil. But for the uh, sandy soil, uh, when the wave propagation is about 10 to 10 kilohertz to like 100 megahertz, then you can see uh, it will be affected by this characteristic frequency and the uh, relaxation behavior. So when you measure the shear velocity at high frequency regime, 
then uh, you have to look at the, uh, the characteristic frequency and also the dispersion. So because the, uh, the shear wave velocity can change with frequency. Um, but as the permeability decreases, which means that the, uh, uh, as your particle size goes down, the characteristic frequency increases so that the Gassman equation can be sufficient to model the wave velocity. Wavelength for shear wave approaches to the scale of the particle size. If, like for, in, for example, here is 20 millimeter. So then, um, as the the shear wave, velocity, shear wave propagation at high frequency is affected more by grain scattering effects than by BO dispersion. So, yep. And this is about the uh, Brulin effect. Huh? So practical impact of the BOT results for soil. Uh, most near surface engineering application and the laboratory study can, uh, is affected by the uh, BOT uh, dispersion model. And low frequency, the BP is governed by the fluid bulk modulus. And shear, velocity, shear wave velocity is determined by the skeleton stiffness. That's by the Gassman's model. At high frequency, when the wavelength is close to the particle size, scattering is uh, dominant and also the internal heterogeneity. But in the other cases, then the, it can, the wave propagation can be assumed to occur in continuum media and uh, the bio dispersion will affect. Okay, um, here uh, we've seen the effect of porosity and for the P wave, because the fluid bulk modulus is higher than the skeletal bulk modulus. So the porosity changes only cause dispersion about 5%. But in shear wave, the dispersion is, it can be about like 10% to 20%, right? Here, 10% to 20%. So the shear wave propagation is more sensitive to the porosity change in terms of the dispersive behavior. The last section will be the large amplitude excitation. And from the soil uh, dynamics, we've seen this uh, shear modulus or the, the velocity modulus degradation curve like this as the strain increases. Um, below the elastic threshold strain, which is maybe it could be epsilon threshold or gamma threshold. Here is the gamma, they use the shear strain. <clears throat> if your excitation level is less than this threshold shear strain level, then it's okay. Then you can assume there's no perturbation or permanent dis uh, disturbance. But as the shear strain exceeds, becomes larger than this threshold shear strain, then the soil fabric changes. So that the shear modulus degrades, degrades, so the, as amplitude increases, shear strain increases, so shear modulus decreases. As the shear modulus decreases, also wave velocity decreases. <clears throat> and this can happen when you have like cross-hole tomography, and if you hit it really hard, then in this near field, the strain is bigger than the uh, threshold shear strain so that they, you have stiffness degradation. Um, this kind of a modulus degradation curve can be uh, described by several models. And one is hyperbolic model, and the other is rainbow oscillator model. And these two are uh, very generally and widely used. And when you draw, when you uh, plot using these two curve, then it, the shape looks like this. So hyperbolic model is this one. And Lambert-Wolf model is this one. So there are some parameters here that you can play with. Huh? Here's alpha naught, right? And here's alpha, alpha naught and the G norm. And what else? Here's the, some threshold uh, shear strain. And here R and R fine. Hmm? That's all for this lecture five. Uh, thank you for listening.